What do we know about Russian cyber hacking? Ooh. Fancy Bear, APT28, Sandworm, Voodoo Bear. It's very important to discuss this group because this group is probably one of the most aggressive and at times thought of as one of the most destructive groups. That bad guy just has the ability to walk from system to system to system. Hey, how can I help to protect my organization? Hi, my name is Gabriel Agarucci, and welcome to Struggle Security, where the theme of the channel is that we are normalizing struggling in cybersecurity. Welcome back again, and today we're going to be covering a subject about the Russian cyber hacking. And what do we know, right? So one thing that's happening in the world, we all probably understand is that's the Russian-Ukrainian war that's occurring right now. And something that happened today is that there was a statement put out by the U.S. government, specifically President Biden, about what is happening from a cybersecurity perspective as it concerns Russia. I just want to point out a couple of different excerpts here to kind of provide emphasis on the importance of this type of thing that's happening right now. It says, I have previously warned about the potential that Russia could conduct malicious cybersecurity attacks against the United States, including as a response to the unprecedented economic costs we've imposed on Russia alongside our allies and partners. It's part of Russia's playbook. Today, my administration is reiterating that those warnings based on evolving intelligence that the Russian government is exploring options for potential cybersecurity attacks. One more piece here that I want to emphasize where he says and kind of concludes everything and says, we need everyone to do their part to meet one of the defining threats of our time your vigilance and urgency today can prevent or mitigate attacks tomorrow. And that's the question, right? Why is this important? Mm -hmm. I think it's important because the president of the United States thinks it's important for our nation. Mm. Pretty much he knows things that we don't know. And yeah, I think the fact that he has this type of intelligence and information to say, hey, get ready for some potential negative Russian cyber attacks. I think that that's important enough for us to believe that it's, it's also important. You know, it begs the question of what do we know about Russian cybersecurity capabilities? What do we know about Russian cyber hacking? And I think that I wanted to give a disclaimer that I can only speak about, or we as cybersecurity professionals can only speak about things that we know, right, within the community, things that we know, not all the stipulations or all of these theories or all of these things that we don't know, right? But we need to talk about what we've known and what we've seen as it concerns Russian cyber hacking in the history. And typically, one way that we know what this is, is that we've been able to document the history of these cyber threat groups called APTs or Advanced Persistent Threats. I don't know if you ever have went through some cybersecurity trainings where they talk about different hats, right? So they talk about the white hat, the gray hat, and the black hat. White hat hackers are typically what you call ethical hackers or penetration testers or red teamers. These are groups or individuals who hack for good. They find the vulnerabilities, they find the exploits, they find the bad things within systems and companies. They tell it to them without a negative type of reasoning behind it. But the gray hat hackers are people that kind of are in the middle. They might disclose vulnerabilities to organizations they might have hacked somebody's system to tell them what the bad was. So it's somewhere between good and bad. It's that gray area emphasis on gray hat hackers. Now, the black hat hackers fall into this category of APTs, advanced persistent threats. And these are highly skilled organizations or people that are typically government sponsored or government financed organizations. And that is where we see a lot of the Russian cybersecurity capabilities come from, from APT groups. And the first APT group I want to speak about is that of what you call Fancy Bear or APT-28. And they're a cyber group that has been attributed to the Russian government, specifically the unit 26165, and have been active since around 2004. Some things that um, they have done or have been attributed to is the Hillary Clinton campaign, the Democratic National Convention, Democratic Conventional or Congressional Campaign Committee in 2016 in an attempt to interfere with the U.S. election, presidential election process. Um, also, between 2014 and 2018, the group has conducted cyber attacks against the U.S. anti-doping agency, a U.S. nuclear facility and um, spy Swiss chemicals laboratory and other groups and other organizations. The thing I want to pull out here is that we see that this APT-28 or Fancy Bear 
has had the capability of getting into some very critical and very high profile systems and organizations over time. So that's part of some of that capability there. Second one I wanna go over is that of Sandworm and some also call this group Voodoo Bear. These funny names for these groups, it's not funny about the things that they have done and the cyber activities that they have conducted within the world. So it's very important to discuss this group because this group is probably one of the most aggressive and at times thought of as one of the most destructive groups coming out of or has been attributed to Russian activity. Sandworm team is thought of as a disruptive or a destructive threat group and they have been attributed to um, the Russian government's unit 74455 and they have also been active um, since 2009. A notable attack includes December 2015 and 2016. The Sandwork Group used a type of malware called Indestroyer or um, Crash Override. And the malware was used in a cyber attack against companies for the electrical grid infrastructure, specifically disturbing supply chain for electrical organizations for more than 225,000 Ukrainian customers. They have the ability to turn off the lights or they have e expressed or displayed the ability to turn off the lights by affecting electrical grid organizations. And I don't know if you know, but everywhere has electrical grid organizations. Your local utility typically has substations that exist within residential areas where it has all types of electrical devices and electrical systems that can be effective from a cybersecurity perspective or cyber perspectives. And the third one is kind of somewhat of an interesting one where this one comes from a Russian speaking uh, user who was able to jump on a local for or a forum online with the XSS.IS forum. And they put in a request for some affiliates. The user's name was Darks Up. Right, so, and they were doing something called selling ransomware as a service. So they were selling ransomware as a services and purchases of the confirmed affiliates were considered to be business partners. Um, and this wasn't only selling ransomware, but there was an entire business model or business structure associated with this type of crime. And yes, this is crime. This is one of these financially motivated ransomware type of activities. So the, some of the business structure was that of um, the ransomware as a service operators will only get 25% um, of the ransomware fees that were under 500,000. And they would get 10% of the ransomware fees that were greater than 5 million. But it's so funny because according to some of those affiliates or those business partners is that the creators of the ransomware as a service or called dark side, they were not living up to their business commitment. So you're talking about a crime within a crime within a crime, right? So two criminals get together and discuss some type of business model. And then one of the criminals uh, reneges on their uh, business commitment where they weren't giving them the money. They weren't giving them that amount. But the thing about it is that um, this wasn't only just crime happening, but this was heavily financially beneficial crime where Dark Side netted at least 60 million in its first seven months of operation, with 46 million of it coming in the first three months of the year. And Dark Side made another 10 million in one month from something that's very notable. And that hack actually affected su supply chain and gas supplies um, for a period of time. So the impact to that critical infrastructure was great. So we see three of these different things, right? We see the ability to um, get into very high profile and critical infrastructure environments, places like nuclear uh, facilities, chemical facilities, um, national or democratic political type of systems see their ability to turn off the lights. And also we see some financial motivation behind some of these. These are kind of a summation, right? At, at a high level too, because there are some very strong details if you go into some of these blogs where I'll put into some of the dis descriptions, but it doesn't stop, stop there because there's also good news. As we've seen from the history of what the cyber hacking or Russian cyber hacking capabilities were, we also see that many organizations are becoming more and more equipped to dealing with this. And organizations are giving out recommendations for what to do about this. From a recent webcast entitled Anticipating and Preparing for Russian Cyber Attacks by Mandiant, they've answered the question of what can organizations and people do to protect themselves? And they kind of break it down into three different sections. One is that of access, 
Another one is that of credentials and connectivity. I'll deal with these at a high level just, just to give you uh, like, like some a taste into what organizations and people can do. And as you're listening, put on your own cybersecurity hat, your white hats and think about, hey, how can I help to protect my organization or how can I help to add these things to my arsenal in order to protect organizations from some of this potential cyber hacking activity? You want to understand all of the abilities for the bad guys to get in. You know, does your organization have internet facing systems that can be detrimental to you if they are able to get in? Many times bad guys get in from just a simple phishing email. You know, you receive an email, you click on it and boom, the bad guys are in. So is there a program there in place within your organization? And is there a way or any type of metrics that are measuring the effectiveness of that? Another one is as it concerns credentials. What is your organization's password policy? And does that password policy go across all systems and all environments? I know for organizations I've done vulnerability assessments on or cybersecurity assessments on, that hasn't always been the case. There might be a password policy system for their enterprise environment or for their industrial type of systems. Some of those password policies don't apply where you even have shared accounts or shared passwords and credentials for systems. So that can be a vulnerability to the system that bad guys like the like the Russian APT groups can take advantage of. Do you have remote log on capabilities for your local admin admin accounts? Many of those Windows systems have the ability to have local admin accounts where people and bad guys can install uh, software and malware onto your system in order to get to their goal of doing bad and harm. So if they take over one system, can they remotely log on to other systems and endpoints? So say for instance, your machine got compromised because they have that local admin capability there. Can they go from that machine and move laterally to your coworker's machine or to your boss's machine or to somebody else within your office or, in, or environment? These are things to consider as it concerns credentials. And last but not least, that of connectivity. Is there network segmentation? Do you have your domain controller and your critical servers on the same subnet or same network as things like your heating and cooling systems, which are building management systems? Do you have all of that in the same subnet or network? Um, and is that even necessary? Because the thing about it is that when bad guys get in, they want to get to all the systems that will allow them to accomplish the bad that they want to do. So when you don't have segmentation or when you don't have separation of systems, within different sub networks or, virt or virtual local area networks, that bad guy just has the ability to walk from system to system to system with nothing stopping them from accomplishing their, their goal. And one more probably as it concerns connectivity, is that looking at necessary ports, protocols, and services. Not all of your devices need every service open on them or every protocol running on them. I know one that's very notable is that of your IPv6. Many Windows systems come with IPv6 um, enabled by default. So say for instance, um, IPv6 is enabled, but it's not being used. A bad guy can come in and utilize IPv6 in order to do man in the middle attacks to gain credentials um, as they wanna elevate privileges or move laterally within the environment. Now, speaking of dark side or the ransomware as a service, I would like to show you what you call like the ransom note that they leave on machines. So this right here, as you can see, is the ransom note. Um, one thing that it encrypts different file systems, different files, and then it leaves this note here on the machine in order to tell the victim what to do once they find this note. It says here at the top, it says, what happened, right? Um, your computers and servers are encrypted. Backups are deleted. We, are, we use strong encryption algorithms, so you cannot decrypt your data. So this is pretty much telling them we have your good stuff. We have all of the stuff within your system and you cannot get it back. Now they continue to go on, it says, but you can restore everything by purchasing a special program for us, the universal decryptor. It says that this program will restore all of your network. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that it will do do that, but they put that there, right? Because they can choose to not that take your money right after you pay it and not send you the universal decryptor. They can do that, right? Because these are again, this is crime. These are bad guys. It says follow our instructions below and you will recover all of your data. Maybe um, so they kind of give this information, but they also put, put some pressure on individuals, too. It says you're here at the bottom. Uh, it says your personal leak page, it gives a personal leak page that says this data is preloaded and will be automatically published if you do not pay. It says after publication, your data, your data will be available for at least six months 
on our Tor CDN server. So the thing about this is that they try to put pressure on the victim to say, if you don't pay, we're gonna publish all your information to the public on our Tor um, servers. This is criminal. And that's just an example of something that you would see if you were going through some type of ransomware attack. Hopefully that wasn't too much. Uh, and for the words that you might be hearing, feel free to jot them down, go to Google University, go to YouTube University and research them, get more and more into it. But those were just three ideas as it concerns access access, credentials, and connectivity. And there's even other efforts too, where CISA or the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, they have a whole website and whole effort called Shields Up. Man, this is an effort by CISA in order to help organizations and people be more prepared for some of these potential Russian cybersecurity attacks for US organizations. And I'll have that website there. And they even provide a website and a number in order to call, and it's 24 seven, if your organization thinks that they have experienced some type of cybersecurity incident. So there are some good news that have come out of this, but we have went over a lot of different information. Feel free to go back to get more and more of this, and I'll have more and more information in the description section. But hopefully this has been valuable to you. For a newer person or somebody transitioning into cybersecurity, it's very important to understand not only all the technical things, the fun things, but also the things that affect organizations, such as the potential for um, Russian APT groups to affect US infrastructure. So hopefully this has been valuable to you once again, and come back for more and more of the struggle security content where we are normalizing struggling in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm.